Okay. I'm going to read a little excerpt, as I've been used to doing here, from the various publications, the various books that were written about linebacker two, and I'll do that now so that we can move on. I find my glasses off the floor again. <laughs> this is a quote out of this book, and it's a combat story. The pre-IP, or initial point, was the point where we turned east in, into North Vietnam, <clears throat> starting certain bomb preparation checklists and picked up our fighter escort. It was also the point where we became vulnerable to the SA-2 and the AAA sites, anti-aircraft uh, sites. We could already hear the SAM launch calls from the aircraft that preceded us. Five minutes past this point, my pilot said, SAM launch, DW, it's coming right at us. I had not picked up the radar signal yet, but I can guarantee that I put every possible jammer on the SAM frequency. It detonated in front and below us. Then I picked up the radar signal for the active SAM site as we saw more launches. We called our sightings to the other cells as they called theirs to us. The Hammer Wild Weasel aircraft were busy attempting to locate the sites and to fire their radar homing missiles. Our gunner scanned the skies for MiGs. Except for external SAM calls, I was oblivious to anything but my countermeasure systems. All of my jammers were active, but they still required constant tuning and monitoring. We hit the IP about 30 miles from the target. At this point, each of the three aircraft, which were designated cell lead, turned to head toward the target. As Aqua 1, we led not only the Aqua cell of three, but the two cells behind us, red and gold. As we looked down, there were fires everywhere. The cells ahead of us <coughs> had already dropped their weapons or were in the process of doing so. And still the SAMs and AAA came. They were detonating all around us. I now had over 50 enemy radar signals on my scope. I had five different SAM radars up, at least one in each quadrant. The cockpit flashed each time a burst went off near us. I had more threat radars than jammers, and still they kept coming. And the radar navigator called five, four, three, two, one, bombs away. Good. Stop release. Turn. We cranked into a sharp bank as I picked up the SAM radar that was off my scope in intensity. The fighter escort called, Aqua One, you have a SAM launch. You have three coming up. We started evasive maneuvers in the turn, and still they kept coming. The Hammer aircraft moved into position and fired his strike, and they still kept coming. One passed below, but the other two streaked less than 500 feet above us and detonated. Then all excitement broke loose as Hammer called, Lock on, <coughs> you got an uh, iron hand, you got an iron hand. We had destroyed the site. The SAM signals went off the air. We breathed easier. There were more SAM launches and AAA bursts, but now we could maneuver, and most importantly, we were heading home. As we passed the terminate countermeasures point, I started to log the radars. Our wave had encountered 68 SAMs, 22 against our cell, but we had survived. As soon as we landed, I would call home. I wanted to, them to know how much I missed them. Now, the person who wrote the, that person who's about is sitting over, over on my right here. And that's Ken Zeta, who's our next speaker. Thank Ken. you very much. <laughs> Morning. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you about my experiences during my back or two. Specifically the first day. Okay, first a little bit of personal history and personal background. 
<laughs> We've been married, Helen and I have been married 51 years. We have five children and 12 grandchildren. We retired in 1985. I was 44 years old, and since then, we spent the last 30 years traveling around the world. We've uh, been to 52 countries 132 times, 570 cities, uh, all seven continents. And uh, according to TripAdvisor, we've logged 836,000 miles of travel. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful world out there. As far as my Air Force experience, I entered the Air Force in 1965. Did five tours in Vietnam from 1968 to 1973. During that time, I had 247 combat missions in which I was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross <coughs> and the Air Medal with 12 oak leaf clusters. After my tours in 1973, by 1974, I transitioned to RADC, to Rome Lab. And there, I took my knowledge that I had gained about from the Russian radars that we been flying against and brought that over and worked in the IR area where we built simulators, which is a whole story in itself. After that, since computers were going from room-sized behemoths mm -hmm. down to things that would actually fit on desktops, they're going to be about this high, we figured, and cost about $20,000 a piece, but they were coming into the office, I was assigned to a program to figure out what do we do with these things in an office, and that's when I retired in 1985. <laughs> I'm going to begin by just giving a little background about the B-52 itself. What we're talking about as far as aircraft and capacity is concerned. This is the B-52. It weighs about 500,000 pounds, of which half of it, about 250,000 pounds, is fuel. The pilot and co-pilot sit up front with the electronic warfare officer and the gunner right behind them, but, but facing backwards. The navigator and radar navigator sit downstairs. It's a very, very, very cramped quarter for a plane this size. At five foot six, except for the hatchway, there was no place that I could stand up in the plane. So I was crawling around for all those hours in all that dark environment. <clears throat> this was my compartment, the electronic warfare officer compartment. And as you can see here, each of those boxes is a jammer. Many of them in E band, many of them in F band, some C, some B, some I, some, you know, all over the spectrum to encounter any threat that we came up against. This was my main scope, the ALR 20, and on that I had traces. Now, on those traces would be blips. Now, those blips would indicate to me by the sound whether it was an enemy aircraft or an enemy threat or whether it was just in a normal one of our radar. My job then was to take each of those jammers and sort of like a maestro and an orchestra, tune those jammers to go right on top of the enemy signal, and therefore either jam it or deceive the enemy into thinking we were somewhere else when we were really there. In the event bailout was needed, the pilot, the co-pilot, the gunner, and I would eject upwards, the navigator and radar navigator downwards, and then anybody who was along with us sitting in any of the instructor seats, such as the airborne commander, who was very important on these missions, who was usually in the wave lead, uh, would have to go down the ladder and actually jump out of one of the hatches that had been opened by the exiting of the navigator or the radar navigator. On the 12th of April, 2008, I visited Charcoal One. For 35 years, she had been there alone. For 30 minutes, I remained with her, my hand resting on her skin. It feels cold and lifeless. But somehow it's important for me to think, to me, me to feel that she knows I'm there. This is our story. As Colonel Winberg says, Harry Winberg said, the prelude was not going well. The North Vietnamese had walked away from the talks. We needed something to get their attention. And Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger decided that there was a good possibility we could do so by taking the might of the United States Air Force, the strategic might, and putting it against the most heavily defended target in the history of aerial warfare. They knew there would be losses, but were they willing to take 
that chance, and history proves that yes, they did. We were supposed to go home on the 16th of December. As I said, I had Helen and the kids over there. Not approved over there, but over there nevertheless. <laughs> and I had sent them home about three days or four days prior to this. And I had gone back onto the base to, uh, to spend the time with my sweet mates and, and to fly our missions out of there. Because we were going home on the 16th of December. <coughs> this is what the suites looked like on Guam. Basically, these are the barracks that we stayed in, three floors. And over here, you see, it was sort of like a, uh, you know, two crews occupied one suite. We were on the right-hand side, as Griffiths, and those are the beds, and it was separated by a bathroom and closets. We had a common foyer, and Bly Blue Crew, who we'd flown with many, many times, were very good friends because all of us had in the area of 200 missions at that time. The Bly Blue Crew was on this side. We knew there was something wrong because all of a sudden, on the 16th of December, all of our go-home days for anybody who was leaving, the Blyville crew, in fact, was going home with us, were canceled. All missions were stopped dead. They told us that anybody who observed anything and mentioned anything about what they saw was up to uh, come up for court-martial offense. We were sequestered to the base, no one was allowed to leave, and one crew member must be in telephone contact at all times. With all this confusion and trying to figure out where we're going, what we're doing, no one had a clue, we went over to our sweet mates and, you know, we heard them talking, and we said, you guys know what's going on, and we heard the co-pilot saying, Bobby Thomas, saying, um, I don't know, he said, but I really want to get home. He says, I'm going to be a member of a standboard crew, which means he wasn't coming back here. The standboard crews were the elite crews that trained other crews, and therefore they never came back overseas. They tra trained in the States. In addition, his wife was having a baby, just just had her, and he wanted to go home to just see the baby. On the other hand, to show you the difference of opinion, radar navigator Dick Johnson, he said, look, we're paid to fly, we're paid to obey orders, and that's all exactly what I'm very happy we're going to do. If they want us to stay, they want us to fly, so be it. That's exactly what we're going to do. So there was a difference of opinion there. They were told that they would be a spare aircraft, which means they weren't going to take, they weren't going to fly the mission. They simply sit on the end of the runway, fully loaded, engines running, and in the event an aircraft aborted for some reason, they would take the runway and fly. But the probability of their flying was small. We received a call at about 8 o'clock at night, and it said, you're going to be Aqua 1, the cell leader, on the third wave on that first day, on the second wave on that first day. The magnitude of this operation came to us as we looked out onto the lawns, and where there's normally 30 or 40 crew members waiting for the buses to come. The first wave went out on the lawn at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and there was 200 crew members coming out of their billets and going down onto the ground. Buses pulled up, took them away to the briefing room. It was followed three hours later by our group. Again, once again, 200 came out, sitting on the lawn. And I remember sitting there, looking at everybody all sitting on the lawn waiting for the buses and wondering who among them would not be coming back 14 hours from now. Then I got the strange impression they were looking at me wondering the same thing. <laughs> As we got onto the buses and got out, <clears throat> walked towards the briefing room, there was a panorama of the runway in front of us, and the first wave was taxiing out. Probably one of the most awesome sights I had ever seen. 27 shark fin tails in a row, taxiing slowly, getting into position, engines roaring, but nobody taking off yet. In 1,500 hours, the first aircraft, Snow One, took the runway, who was the wave leader, applied his engines, got his water, and he took off. We were taking off in something called a Mido, a minimum interval takeoff. And for those of you who have ever seen a Mido, you know, you can attest to how absolutely impressive. 500,000 pound aircraft, 15 seconds apart. The roar of the engines, it really, really, really is um, a thrilling sight. It reminded me very much of gathering of eagles, 
which was Brock Hudson's movie there. And um, in fact, what I'm going to play is that part of the Mito from Gathering of Eagles, so you can see what we experienced. And if you would, place yourself now. This, of course, are 52s in a film, but it was exactly this way. Picture, large black aircraft, one after another, taking the runway, taking off, standing there and watching this. First aircraft took the runway, applied power, fully loaded with bombs, all took off. The seventh aircraft rolled onto the runway, applied power, <coughs> did not get the water injection that is needed to lift off the hot Guamanian runway, and aborted. Spare aircraft took its place, applied power, got water, and took off. What none of us could have known at that time. Well, that was charcoal one. And the pilot, co-pilot, and gunner had less than six hours to live. We went into the briefing room and saw many anomalies very quickly. In a room maybe just about twice or three times the size of this, there normally is a board up there with the target. That board was covered by a cloth. In a room that normally holds about 40 crew members, there were 200 seats. The moon was very, very somber. Standing up in the front, we're not a colonel, but two generals. And Colonel McCarthy came, took the cloth, pulled the cloth down, and said, gentlemen, this is your target. And emblazoned across that screen was the words Hanoi. It was a map that was absolutely filled with surface-to-air missile sites, with the locations of surface-to-air missile sites. Certain things Again, come to mind, and then during the briefing, it was these things. <clears throat> Number one, there were so many SAM sites, they could not plot the AAA sites. Number two, we all had to fly in on the same heading and out on the exact same heading. That was totally against all of our, all of our training of what we should have done. That they'd be burned through for seven minutes, which means my jammers, no matter how powerful and how many I put on, we would still see for that last seven minutes some dot of our B-52 going through. But most importantly, we were not allowed to maneuver. No matter what was coming up, no matter how imminent the impact, before the target, no maneuvering was allowed. So I knew it was all up to the EW, up to me, to make sure that I did it exactly right. Because if I made a single mistake, we weren't going home. These are the air array of the aircraft, and I've placed them here. We flew in, as Harry said, three cells, and each cell led nine aircraft in. Peach was the wave leader and cell one leader, and he led in blue and ruby. Smoke, a cell leader, led in wine and amber. Aqua, and this is us, a cell leader led in red and gold, and then each of us at the IP would go to our separate targets. These are the threats that I had to encounter. Triple A site, anti-aircraft artillery, a bunch of guns with an acquisition radar that first acquires you, and then a lock-on radar that locks onto you. And once I got that high whistle sound, I knew that I'd better get the jammers on there, because again, we were being targeted. 
Um, and this is what that sound, and I listen for sound of light. The more potent threat was the SA-2 SAM or the radar being, the radar being called a fan song. It was a very, very particular thing because it was locked on the second you saw it. It had a beam that went this way, a beam that went this way. And when the cross part of those beams, there was no acquisition radar, there you were. Very, very difficult to jam. It was an E band. And this is what that sounded like and what I would listen for. And you'll hear that again. That chirping sound. Something you don't want to hear, but more than that, that you don't want to hear was this radar right here, the uplink, the terminal radar, what we call the BG-06. Because when you heard that, it had such a narrow beam, that when you hear that, that means oh, those missiles have got your name on it. And they would come up, and then with their antenna facing backwards, it was very, very difficult to get the jammers into there. So I would crank every jammer I had over there to try to block them and break that lock so they would fly by. This is what that sound sounded like. That buzzing sound. Okay. The North Vietnamese were very, very clever because they knew that the more that their radars were up, the greater chance at the hammer, the wild weasels would come in and fire a strike. So what they did is they linked all of these radars together, the AAA, the SAN, the uh, fan swung, etc. And combined those that said bring one radar up, bring a radar down, bring another radar up, bring a radar down, to give our, uh, our, their, our people as little chance as possible to see it. So our, my environment sounded like this. Our route. Our route came in from the east, crossed Vietnam, and this was the start countermeasures point here. We were ordered that all of us had to turn our jammers on. We then turned north in Laos to parallel Viet North Vietnam, up to the pre-IP where we would pick up our fighters to come in to protect us against the MiGs. And then do a bunch of checklist items before we hit the IP about 30 miles from the target. At that point, again, we would all break off to our separate targets, drop the bombs, join up again, turn, and come back. I'd like to say that I did my pre-flight just like any other day as a professional. No, I checked everything over absolutely twice. In fact, I turned on all my jammers on the ground. Probably a no-no, but hey. <laughs> they were going to send me to Guam. <laughs> uh, I found, in fact, one jammer out. Had maintenance come over it, they replaced that jammer. And it probably was very important that I did. Our launch was normal. We applied power, got our water, took off, and we were airborne. Refueling. Just to pass the Philippines, we met up with tankers coming in from Kadena, or the Arukian Islands. We link up with them, and this time we took out 56,000 pounds of fuel. Okay. Also, during this time, we had our radios tuned to the strike frequency because at that time, we knew the first wave was coming off of the target. And we wanted to hear what the same activity was, what problems they had, what AAA activities, etc. And the first report immediately did come through. And it said, Spellman, which is Guam's call sign, this is Tabor 87, which is a Snow One, which is a Snow One Airborne Commander, Tabor 87. And he said, heavy SAM activity, all quadrants, heavy AAA activity, all quadrants. Well, I like three is missing. Mm -hmm. And Spellman came back and said, please try to find out what the crew is. Please try to continue to raise them. And five minutes later, Spellman, Tabor 87, we found Lilac 3. She's badly damaged, trying to head into Udorn. Terrible control problems, but she's okay. And we started yelling and screaming in our aircraft, shaking each other's hands, <clears throat> as if we had something to do with Lilac 3 being okay. But then five minutes later came that call. Spellman, this is Charcoal 2. We came out of the post-target turn, and charcoal one was gone. No shoots, no beepers. And Spellman said, could you give me some information about the crew, find out what it is. Charcoal two came back and said, that was Blythe 1-1. One, one. 
That was our sweet mates. The pilot and the gunner were killed immediately. And the co-pilot, Bobby Thomas, would never go home to see his child. And our turn was coming. We hit the SCM point, the Star Town Measures point. There were about eight to ten signals up. My orders, I turned on the jammers, and they were covering those eight to ten signals. But you know, going up that track, as we made a right-hand turn going up that track, I got a feeling that I probably wasn't covering any the signals I should. So I unilaterally made the decision to turn off all my jammers. And instead of those eight to ten signals, there were 40 to 50 signals. And I had not covered any of them. We tuned the jammers, turned back on, and it probably made a significant difference. Okay, I'm now going to play you the tape of the mission itself. Where we are is we're approaching the IP. To give you the scenario, Peach has already passed the IP, dropping its bombs, the Peach Wave, which is blue and ruby also. Sweep the Peach Cell. They're dropping their bombs. <coughs> Smoke is approaching the pre-IP, and he's calling in the ram aircraft to come and accompany him as they're heading towards the target. We're just behind, about four minutes behind, and this is where this starts. Just to let you know, this is a very noisy tape because our own jammers played into all of that sound and probably were our own enemy. In fact, just to give a, a thanks, when I gave this briefing, or something very similar to this, 25 years ago, right, Fred? 25 years ago, Dr. Uh, Dr. Heritonis, his Fred's group, actually took this tape, and what you hear is a cleaned up version, as noisy as this is, yeah, it was a cleaned up version of what of what we uh, of, of what we experienced. So you're going to hear noise here, and the uh, conversations through it. Yes. Were they all taped? Were all these? Tapes every mission was taped by every aircraft. Every mission that we flew, so even all every one of these aircraft had a recorder on it. Yeah. Wow. We were at 15 sixteenths, reel to reel, slow as can be, but it did the job. What I did is, as opposed to other people, is I simply said, "Could you make me a copy of this?" You know, and uh, he did. Okay. So we begin with smoke. Calling the fighters. Smoke ram at it. Line the cell on PCI. Turn right. Zero ninety two. Line two. Zero ninety zero. Line three. Just to give you a, a legend of what's going on here, ram of the fighter aircraft. Smoke is the uh, the second the second uh, wait cell lead, and he's calling the fighters in. The colors, lime, aqua, red, ruby that you're going to see here are transmissions from other crews. Anything in red is our crew. Here, I pick up a AAA lock on it and announce it. Anything in red, like me, with parentheses on it, is what my equipment is doing. As you see here, there's the high whistle of the AAA lock on, and I broke that lock. At this exact point, at this exact point, Peach 2 is hit. Two missiles, striker, and she's very badly damaged. Three engines are on fire. She's losing fuel badly and having trouble being uh, uh, controlled. So what she says, what Peach Three is doing, and you will see in a second, is trying to get information about the crew members' names. Okay, and I'll stop this again, but then we're going to continue on pretty much un unstopped after this. Basically, what's happening here is Peach 3 is getting Peach 2's names. Hammer, the uh, Wild Weasel aircraft, is saying to us, ourselves, missile coming up, break left, break left. He doesn't realize we can't break anywhere. We've got to stay, stay up and straight and level. Basically, they're also, everyone's very concerned about Peach, so Peach 1 is talking to Peach 2. And what the Peach 2 aircraft commander said is, look, do your mission. Don't worry about me. You'll see that in the next sentence, in essence. He said, I've talked to my crew. And if we were to leave this earth, so be it. Hello, 
way of smoke. No more UCRB. Stand by. One MIG did come up, fighters went in, he just turned tail and ran, that was the only MIG we saw. Ram smoke is 7 0 miles from India Papa. Line 140. Ram smoke 7 0 miles from India Papa. Line 140. I'll take one. Two, this will stay on the side. Thank you for being here, sir. I'm sure you got some gun boy in. So it's a boy around the front, Andrew. I'll go out and start on the first side. I'll go out and start on the first side. I'll go out and start on the first side. I'll go out and start on the first side. I'll go out and start on the first side. I'll go out and start on the first side. I'll go out and start on the first side. I'll go out and start on the first side. Basically, what's happened here is Peach 3 behind Peach 2 sees the fires in Peach 2, but he also sees right now that his wing tank, his, his fuel tank, just breaks off and takes part of the wing with it. He's having more and more trouble. And basically, also, P2 is starting to fall back and out of the way, okay, and he's losing fuel quickly. We're picking up our fighters now. Okay, we're uh, just going to get up here. I'm going to rush down. Line off means he picked up the radar, but then lost it. He said the line is off, he hasn't got it. But all the time, Hammer 3 are firing their missiles and trying to get these SAM sites. Okay, 
writing in blue. What that is is just background. Those are the navigator and radar navigator reading to each other the checklist. So I place it in blue because you're going to hear this and you're going to hear sound. So this is what they're saying. It's sort of background information. But we're approaching now the IP, getting ready to drop the bomb. Certain things have to be accomplished. <laughs> Okay, Peach 2 understands he hasn't even got the fuel to make it back. He's going to turn and he's going to go back into Utapau. He's going to try to go into Utapau. He doesn't want any fighters, he just wants to go in alone. And Beach One calls in the fighters. He said, no, you're not going to do that. And without question, the fighters rose into position on each side of Beach Two. We'll stay with you, friend. This is the direct quote. We'll stay with you, friend. It looks like your fire, fires are getting worse, and you may not make it. They did not make it into the problem. <laughs> Let's 
Of course, right here, you know that the B-52 has stability problems. Also, the pilot and co-pilot are looking out their window. They're not watching the FCI, the flight control indicator. That's got to be right down dead center if they want to drop the bombs where they're supposed to drop on. So the radar navigator now is saying, you're not, you're not following your flight plan. You're not following your path. And you're going to hear it. He just absolutely eloquently beseeches the pilot to do the radar is getting stronger and much harder to break now. The radar navigator is now calling to the cell to head it. Two minutes to drop. And throughout all of this, you're going to hear only Aqua 2 replying. You know why? Aqua 3 turned off all his radios. It was too noisy. <laughs> <laughs> They can't make it, they've got to get out. Sixty seconds to go to bomb drop. Last stop. All hell's going to break loose right now, as Harry Winberg, as Colonel Winberg read to you in that narrative. What's going to happen is we're going to drop the bombs. Radar's going to say turn. I just having such a hard time breaking those lock-ons. We go into a turn, probably cranking it a little bit more than we should have. Our jammers now are aiming out this way rather than down at the SAMs. I call the SAM launches to the pilots. The pilots call the SAM launches out over the air. And all of a sudden we hear, Aqua, you've got two SAMs coming up. Followed by three seconds later, Aqua, you've got two more coming up. Hammer aircraft pulls into position. He has fired all of his arm missiles. He's got one strike left. He fires that one strike, and on the ground there is a fireball where that SAM site was. Yeah. Lose the signals. The, radar, the uh, SAMs come up now. They're blind. Two detonate above us, two detonate just below us. You're going to hear all of that. All of this now is in the drop and the post target turn in the next few seconds. Can't break it. Just can't break it. We've got everything on it. We've got burn I'm 
Well, we can't leave any more SAMs even on the way out. However, including my jammers, we can now maneuver and that would be a big difference. Certain vignettes come to me and that I will never forget. Coming home that night, watching the TV in our quarter, and seeing Bob Certain, Tom Simpson, and Dick Johnson on TV that night, but now at Hanoi as prisoners of war. The moving van coming up the next day and just bringing their stuff out of the van, to the van, and packing their belongings up to go home. The hope we gave to the prisoners of war were down on the ground at that time. They heard the B-52s coming over. They saw the North Vietnamese trying to get into the prisoner of war camp because they knew that we would not be bombing there. It was the safest place in Hanoi. But most importantly, the hope we gave them. As it was reported over and over again that I've seen on TV, every prisoner of war said one. They knew the 52s were over there. They knew we were coming for them. They'd be going home soon. Proof of the effectiveness of our electronic calculations. On the 28th of December, Brass 2 had massive ECM failure, only two jammers operating. They called Guam and asked them to return, if they could return. Guam said no, Phil, and they'd have more protection if they were saved with the wave. So Brass 2 tucked in as quick, as closely as possible to Brass 1. But with no ECM, the first two missiles struck the plane in the wing. The second two missiles struck the plane in the bomb. On Sunday afternoon, several years later, watching TV, Giants Kansas City game, and seeing Derek Thomas talk about his dad. And once again, Bobby's picture came up onto the screen. And finally, Helen and my trip to Vietnam in 2008. Started in Saigon, went north to Dalat, Da Nang, Nha Trang, Hoi Han, Wei, and finally to Hanoi. On the 12th of April, 2008, I visited Charcoal One. For 35 years, she had been there, alone. For 30 minutes, I remained with her, my hand resting on her skin. It feels cold and lifeless. But somehow it's important for me to feel that she knows I'm there. Because I have one more thing to do. To Don Reese, to Bobby Thomas, and to Fergie, and to Chalk Hope one. One last time. I said goodbye. Thank you. I'm sorry, thank you. Day. Thank you very much. Our targets were the Kino Rail Yards, the Storage Depot, and the northern part of Hanoi were our targets. But the targets, each aircraft cell had sets of different targets. Yes. Thank you. What a question. Yes, go ahead. I might have misunderstood you. You, you talked about them asking the names of the people in an aircraft. Right. Uh, so it could be reported back to Spellman, you know, in case there was any confusion, they were taking names. I, why, I'm not sure. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. they should know who's in Q3 yeah. yeah. or yeah. Yeah, Amber 1. Or, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, because it may be spare, we're taking off. Some of these aircraft actually were from Uta Power also. So it was just trying to get the confusion. Okay. Yes. I thought there was emergency landing available in Laos. There was emergency, that was, uh, well, it was in Tha well, either Laos or Thailand, Peach Sioux decided to go into Udorn to try to get into uh, to Uta Pau. Try also then to get into Udorn, didn't make it either way. By the way, just a little aside if I may, I've got folders for you here. <coughs> the bottom story on Peach 2, they all ejected, including the assistant airborne commander, the vice airborne commander. He had to go out of the hole. They all were rescued safely. But that story firsthand is in a folder that I've prepared for you, as is Charcoal One's firsthand experience by Bob Certain, who related what happened to their aircraft. I'll give you each of those out, or please take them as you're leaving. As was the speech I gave here, as was Hammer's account when he lost all of his strike missiles and had that one more left. So Hammer Three, firsthand account of how he knocked out that site, is there also. How many total aircraft? B-52s did we lose? We lost 15 B-52s. 15. That, that's now shot down. Damage beyond repair were probably another 10. Bottom line is we lost 10% of the B-52 force. They were either shot down or inoperable during a linebacker two. Why was the intelligence so poor? You mentioned that yourself. That's hard to believe it. Sure. It's, <laughs> it's basically when missions are planned by people other than those on site, terrible mistakes are made. You have no idea the level of bureaucracy that one goes through as you start getting up to the headquarters level. I was, spent three years in Washington between my choice at RDC, and it is, it's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. Um, you have people who, who absolutely know the truth and just absolutely going to tell you what to do because they, all they want to do is head up the next level to the, get in front of the next general. Forgive me for... for uh, well, that's no different than corporate America anyway. <laughs> <laughs> sure. The radio transmissions that we heard, was everybody hearing those or just your squadron, just your flight? No, again, all of those, uh, all of the calls by outside were heard by everyone. Yeah. Now, everything in red was heard inside internal towers. How in the world do you know what to listen to? <laughs> With great difficulty. I served with an idiot lieutenant colonel <laughs> that was in DOX at uh, Dias Air Force Base in Abilene, and he uh, bragged about that he had planned some of these missions and that they went in at the same heading, at the same altitude, at the same time of day. And I didn't say anything because I was a major, and I'm thinking, you idiot. Mm -hmm. We have uh, discussed those people and probably that guy for the last few <laughs> 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 yeah, weeks. Yeah, um, where did you receive your training? Because you seem to be very good at what you do. What was your background before you went into the military? I have an engineering degree at NYU. Uh -huh. Then I got my master's degree at you know, the University of Southern California. And after retiring, by the way, I got another electrical engineering degree right here. But, uh, but my training was basically just engineering. Went into electronic warfare school. But it was just, it was just experience, 247. Well, at that time, I had about 210 combat missions of pure experience. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm just glad that uh, all these crew members uh, were sent into the meat grinder and got out alive to tell their stories. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of figures thrown out during the past four sessions. Uh, a couple that I jotted down. Uh, during linebacker two, there's 60,500 pound bombs that were dropped. That's equivalent to 15,000 tons of TNT, which is equivalent to one Hiroshima bomb. Was there ever any discussion to use you? No, never. At never. A higher that level. happened in that happened in Korea, mm -hmm. and as you know, General MacArthur was uh, somewhere really dismissed for that suggestion to drop the nukes on the uh, because you open up a whole new theater when you do that. Uh -huh. You're not only fighting the North Vietnamese, but you're also fighting. You've got almost got Russia and China sitting right. there with nukes. Go ahead, sir. Uh, also, an interesting stat, in uh, World War II, there's a total of two million tons of bombs that were dropped yeah. uh, throughout the, uh, the whole war, and uh, set versus seven million tons of bombs dropped on uh, Vietnam. Yeah. And then, of course, two years after this, uh, South, Vietnam, South Vietnam fell. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just a little aside also, and, uh, because we're talking about bomb dropping and things like this, within that folder also, we visited Khe Sanh. The Battle of Khe Sanh, or the Siege of Khe Sanh, was 40,000 North Vietnamese 
burrowing in under the ground and above the ground and into a group of our troops that were on a hill. And there were 5,000 of those troops on, our, on a hill. Decoys. And I've got my, our recollections of that. I've been driving on to we, the 52s. We're circling above all of the time with all of those bombs, getting coordinates and dropping within 30 yards of our troops for 77 days around the clock. I've got that account in there also. It's a very emotional account of, of war and combat itself. Yes? An interesting <coughs> recent comment. We had a group of foreign students in Rome at the Rotary Club, and there was one young man from Vietnam, and he was from Saigon, and somebody said, you mean Ho Chi Minh City? He said, no, it's Saigon. <laughs> For whatever that means to you guys. <laughs> yes. Interesting aside, uh, I transported General Westmoreland in our EC-135 from Honolulu to uh, LBJ's ranch mm. once a month. Wow. For three years, between 65 and 68. Wow. And that, that paper... Micromanagement. Oh, absolutely. Oh, that paper that I'm talking about mentions Westmoreland. Yeah, definitely. Yes. I, I met a retired Marine and we exchanged in war stories and told him I flew B-52s. He was at Quezon and he probably <coughs> kissed my hand. Okay, well, thank you very much once again. I'll get back to you in a moment. A couple of wrap-up items here that uh, I think are somewhat important. I would mentioned them before, but I'll do it again. We had total B-52s that were shot down were 15, and that's a lot of airplanes for 11 days of Christmas that we had then. There were over 1,300 crew members that flew one or more missions. There were 92 crew members that were involved in the 15 that went down, and there were 28 crew members who were killed in action. For that 11 days is quite a bit. The only other one I had was, he mentioned Bob Certain. And Bob Certain I read about two months ago in a magazine where he had just retired from being a minister yes. in, in one of the uh, noted churches in this country. So he changed his life being a minister following that period of time. Thank you very much for joining us. We enjoyed having you.